Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for attending our sports acupuncture webinar sponsored by the American Acupuncture Council. My name is Matt Callison. I'm here with my colleague and good friend, Brian Lau. Hello. Last month, we had Josh Lerner as a guest. I was not able to make it last month, but Brian and Josh talked about trigger points quite a bit and the pathophysiology and also different clinical uses. We wanted to this month to discuss and build upon last month's uh, narrative. We want to talk about the compare and contrast of what is a motor point, what is a trigger point, which is a very, very common question, and also how to use them clinically. So before we actually start going into, let me talk about Josh a little bit here on the reason why we have him is he's like Brian, who is a uh, not only just an excellent clinician, but a true academic. So that's a pretty rare combination to have. Uh, Josh graduated from the Northwest Institute of Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine in 2001, and he's currently on faculty of the Seattle Institute of East Asian Medicine, where he's teaching orthopedic medicine, trigger point theory, musculoskeletal A and P, and also points and channels. Now he's studied with Tom Bizio and Frank Butler for quite a while, starting in 2006. He also started taking trigger point release, uh, acupuncture trigger point release in 2007 and started dry needling classes in 2016, which he has become certified in dry needling in 2019. Now being an overachiever that Josh is, he also took the SMAC program at the same time and graduated from the sports medicine acupuncture certification program in 2017. So Josh is welcome. Thank you very much for coming, Josh, and help us out with this podcast webinar. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having so, me. I really um, appreciate being asked back for this. Yeah, absolutely. We'll have fun. All right. So we only have 30 minutes. So let's jump right into what is the motor point? We'll then get into the trigger point and then start talking a little bit about case studies and how to be able to use them. Uh, first things first. The motor point, when I first started studying them, this would be before I was an acupuncturist, when I was going in in uh, physical education and athletic training school at San Diego State University. I graduated from SDSU in 1986. Now in the tra training room, we were taught to use one inch by one inch or two inch by two inch, could be even four inch by four inch electrical pads to place them over the central aspect of the muscle in order to influence the muscle belly or the motor point region. Now it was common to be able to use these pads on agonist and antagonist muscles, for example, hamstrings and quadriceps, or even on hamstrings and then to a distal tendon or a proximal tendon in order to influence the electrical energy of that particular muscle. Now, when I became an acupuncturist graduating from Pacific College of Oriental Medicine, which is now called Pacific College of Health Sciences, graduated from Pacific College in 1992, I always was curious about the motor point and wondered as an acupuncturist, what would it be like to take a highly conductive electrical material, a stainless steel needle, and put it into this region that's defined as having the lowest resistance to electrical conductivity. So therefore, when you have a region that has the lowest resistance to electrical electrical conductivity, that means that there is a enormous amount of chi potential to manipulate. Now, of course, an acupuncture needle is much thinner than a one by one or a two by two pad. So therefore, I started my journey and researching motor points. Where are they located? At that time, nobody was really talking about motor points. Trigger points was the big thing. Um, it was still under a lot of influence of Janet Travell's and Dr. Simon's enormous work in trigger point theory and their books as well. Um, and at that time, like I was saying, motor points really weren't discussed very much. They were mentioned in the Shanghai text of acupuncture, which is an interesting read with that. And then going online, trying to find who was actually doing acupuncture on motor points um, was Dr. Chan Gunn. Now he was up in Canada and he was also researching on motor points, which he's got in some incredible research. If you guys wanted to go and check that out on Google Scholar, um, being more of the dry needler, um, he was really staying quite a bit away from traditional Chinese medicine and taking it more toward the dry needling aspect of it. And, and so 
we'll finish that story at another time. So what I found was taking acupuncture to the motor point region was changing range of motion, changing muscle strength, decreasing pain. And this was really very, very exciting. Um, but trying to find where those motor points are at that time was very difficult because there really weren't that many maps available. It was more of a line drawing with just like a black dot on it. So gathering a number of different research articles, I think it was in the 40s or 50s, and today it's well over 300 research articles that I have on motor points and their locations. But back then, there wasn't very much. So collecting that information and then also electrocuting a triathlete friend of mine with the surface electrode, trying to find exactly where these motor points are, then I would map them and then locate them according to bony landmarks and acupuncture points for the acupuncturist. Now, this was way back in the early 1990s. Um, that was when the motor point manual came out, which I don't even have a copy of that anymore, but also the motor point chart came out. And now since then, it also has been updated, the motor point chart. And this just came out in 2019. The original came out in the year 2000. Now, also, some of the work that I was doing back then in the year 2000 I actually collected a whole lot of notes and started writing quite a bit and then published this treatment of orthopedic disorders manual, which came out, like I said, in the year 2000 or actually 1998, it came out and it's been used at all three Pacific college campuses since then. Now in 2007, then my research came out and published the motor point index in 2007. So long story short, my work has been out there for a long, long time and has actually influenced quite a few people over the years. Um, this has a lot of accountability and a lot of responsibility to it because even as today, motor point locations have changed a little bit. The definition of the motor point has changed. Um, motor points now over these last 15 years are talked a lot about. You'll see research articles all over the place. It has infiltrated our field a lot from the work that I have created, but then also what other people are also doing with motor points. So it's, it's something that is needing some discussion about what is a trigger point and what is a motor point. Now, the definition of the motor point in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s was basically an umbrella term for where the motor nerve inserts into the muscle belly and where the motor nerve inserts at the intramuscular junction, the neuromuscular junction. So both of those locations, which can actually be far away from one another in a muscle, was the umbrella term called motor point. Now, recently, I would say within the last five to seven years, you start to see articles talking about motor entry points. And this is actually a better way of describing where my work has actually been taken is I've been looking for the motor point where it goes actually into the muscle bell itself. And the reason why is because it has the largest diameter of the motor nerve then going into that motor point and has the lowest resistance to electrical conductivity. Now taking that acupuncture needle and inserting it into that spot is where we can actually change quite a few things within that muscle, not only within the muscle itself, but also how the central nervous system views what's happening within that muscle. So the interesting, th interesting thing about this is with motor points, like I said, that's more of an umbrella term for what's now being clearly defined as a motor entry point or where the motor nerve inserts into the neuromuscular junction would be the intramuscular motor point. So again, as the motor nerve comes in and inserts into the muscle itself, has the largest diameter, that goes into the motor, into the muscle, then it usually will bifurcate and go into a proximal part of the tissue and also the distal part of the tissue, sometimes close within an inch, sometimes far away, six to eight inches, depending on the length of the muscle. So these collateral branches from the motor nerve travel within the muscle tissue and then insert into the actual muscle itself. That could be called the intramuscular motor point. So we have motor entry points. We have intramuscular motor points. The umbrella term would be 
motor points. So hopefully that actually helps. Um, you don't really see motor entry point too much discussed in our field, but I'm sure it will start to spread over this next five or 10 years, just, just because it, ha it gives us a little bit more clear definition of what exactly we're trying to be able to treat. Now the motor entry point is where the green triangles are on the sports medicine acupuncture textbook and also on the motor point chart. That's where the motor entry point is located. Okay, so then now the intramuscular motor points themselves, um, those can actually be turning into trigger points with Josh and Brian and I are gonna go ahead and discuss that in just a little bit. Or a trigger point can also develop uh, at the location of the motor entry point. So from here, why don't we now start to compare and contrast with the trigger point? Josh, do you want to take it away? Or Brian, do you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll step in here. And so Matt and I have had lots, and Brian, Matt and Brian and I have all had lots of discussions about um, comparing and contrasting um, trigger point phenomena with motor points. And so there are a few different um, dimensions within which we can kind of talk about these, both contrasting differences and comparing areas that are similar. So one of the things to keep in mind, especially once we start talking a little bit more clinically, is that as helpful as it is to really talk about the, the differences between ideas about motor points versus trigger points, to a large degree, especially clinically, there's a huge amount of overlap and it's uh, if you really like Venn diagrams, there's like a, a big circle about trigger point phenomena and a big circle about motor point phenomena. There's a huge gray area of overlap between the two of them. So I'm going to try and keep that in mind as I'm discussing this, but it might sound at times like I'm being a little bit arbitrarily black and white about differences between them when that's really not the case. So um, one of the one of the areas of contrast is that the motor points are basically a, a normal physiological phenomena. Everybody has motor points, it's just how the body works. Whereas trigger points are very specifically a pathological phenomena. I'm not gonna talk too much about the, the details about trigger point physiology. Brian and I spent an hour actually last time talking about a lot of that stuff. And so if you want to uh, brush up on that, you can kind of go watch the previous podcast that Brian and I did. I think there are also going to be some links to some other discussions that Brian and I and a few others have had about trigger point stuff. So you can refer back to that. Um, so that's the first contrast is just normal physiology versus a pathological condition, right? Trigger points are, they form due to some kind of muscle damage, right? They're a small contracture in a muscle fiber that is the response to either like an excessive eccentric load or a, a low level contraction that goes on a long time and kind of wears out the fiber. Uh, another, another type of contrast between them is that motor points in a lot of ways are more like acupuncture points in that not only everybody has them, but the, the locations tend to be somewhat predictable, even though there can be quite a bit of variety from person to person. Whereas trigger points can really form just about anywhere in a muscle. So when you're looking to treat trigger points, you really have to palpate the entire length of a muscle. Whereas when you are treating motor points, um, you're generally starting from a somewhat relatively defined position. Like it's uh, say, you know, in the middle, like the very middle part of a muscle, or like in the case of say the rectus femoris, one of the common motor points is going to be halfway between like stomach 31 and Huding, right? You still have to palpate locally in the actual location. You're going to be looking for like a kind of an Osher point. It might be, you know, one up to a soon or so away from that point, but you're starting roughly from the um, another, another area of contrast uh, that I think will probably open up an interesting discussion because Matt and I have talked about this quite a bit, is how you use them clinically and what muscles you choose to treat, whether if you're thinking about a trigger point versus a, um, a motor point. And so I'll just kind of 
talk just very briefly about my take on this and then maybe uh, Brian and Matt, if you guys want to pop in and uh, contradict what I'm saying. Awesome, <laughs> awesome, heated, spicy debate going. So motor points in my practice, I tend to use very, uh, to very kind of more generally to really overall improve the functioning of the muscle and to treat in a sense, the skeletal homeostatic balance in the when I'm really focusing a lot on biomechanical issues where there's a joint dysfunction and imbalance of muscle pull across the joint, or I'm treating a, a muscle in one area of the body and I want to treat the entire sinew channel and I might need other muscles more distally or more proximally in that sinew channel. I tend to use motor points in those locations more commonly. Um, and for trigger points, I tend to overall use them more specifically to treat the referral patterns when there's pain or some other like paresthesia that might be part of the referral pattern. But even having said that, there's a huge amount of overlap between them. And so I also very commonly will use trigger points to treat more general biomechanical issues. And I will very often also use motor points to treat painful conditions. Um, and there's a more subtle distinction to be made in how I diagnose personally between the use of those two things. Um, it has to do with the fact that when you have pain, sometimes the pain is coming from a motor point, but you can have pain due to a muscle dysfunction that isn't, sorry, trigger point. Um, you can have pain from a muscle dysfunction that is not from a trigger point pain, but just you can have pain because the muscle itself isn't firing correctly, which can send signals to the central nervous system kind of a warning signal that just something isn't right. We're going to just give you some pain so you stop using the muscle. Um, so you can have cases of pain that are in a muscle that are not due to a trigger point, but they can be helped a lot by motor points. Um, so there, I've just kind of muddied the whole discussion a little mm -hmm. bit with that. So why don't I just, I'll, uh, let's open this up. Matt, Brian, uh, what do you guys want to talk about in terms of that? Uh, Brian, I've got a few things to say, but why don't you go ahead and start? Uh, well, I'll just say something simple, and that's uh, you, both of you guys painted a nice, clear picture of uh, a difference between a motor point and a, and a trigger point. But if you look at a lot of the discussion and sometimes even the research out there, it's not always so clear cut, as, as Josh kind of alluded to with the Venn diagram of how they overlap in terms of um, comparisons. But even in terms of discussion, like Matt was mentioning, sometimes they use the term motor entry point, sometimes motor point to encompass all of that. It's not always very um, consistent. Sometimes there's discussions of trigger points that talk about, like I saw several research articles that talked about an anatomical basis for trigger points. And they were basically looking at the motor entry point as the site of where trigger points tend to form. Um, so the, it's not so clear cut. We're going to try to discuss it from a, um, you know, compare and contrast and as if they're different, but there's a lot of overlap out there. So if you've looked into this at all, sometimes it's easy to get confused because it's confusing because there's a lot of different different people saying different things about it that aren't always consistent. Um, and I know this isn't the case with the newer edition of Travell and Simon's book, but um, in the previous editions, you know, they had X's on sort of the frequent location of where uh, trigger points tend to form and there was numbers, you know, like trigger point number one, upper traps, trigger point number two, and, you know, different regions and different kind of common sites. Now, of course, within that common site, you'd have to palpate and find the exact location um, uh, and it's going to be very variable, but there were sort of go-to sites, uh, so to speak. And um, if you look at those go-to sites, you'll see that those go-to sites tend to be at the motor point, the motor, uh, close to the motor entry point location. Um, where the muscle is getting the innervation. So uh, the reality is that motor points are at the location of where common trigger points form. And both of them share one similar thing in their description and their language is that a motor point is the highest concentration of motor end plates. So motor end plates are the site on muscles that are uh, have receptors for acetylcholine. So a motor point is the highest concentration of motor end points. Uh, motor um, in plates. I think that's more of the classical definition of, of uh, motor points. Now with motor entry points, that's more about the entry side of the nerve. But the classic definition going a little farther back is the highest concentration of motor in plates. 
And trigger point in the language is often described as forming at the site of the highest concentration of motor end plates. So there's a lot of parallel and there's a lot of overlap and it's not always clear to differentiate mm -hmm. one from the other. Mm -hmm. My turn? Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Brian. Um, Josh, Brian, that was awesome. That was good. Uh, in, in my mind, the motor end plates are going to be where the intramuscular mm -hmm. motor points are located. Um, where the motor nerve enters into the muscle, there can be collateral branches that go into the motor end plates, but not always. So let's now take this information and see if we can be able to bring it into some kind of clinical sense. For example, let's also remember, when, before we get into clinical sense, let's remember that motor points also can be used as empirical points that will take pain away from a distant site. And that pain from a distant site has nothing to do with the trigger point referrals. Like for example, a flexor carpi ulnaris motor entry point is pretty magnificent in taking pain away from the levator scapula attachment and that lateral posterior side of the neck. Or the piriformis motor entry point takes pain away from uh, urinary bladder 10 region. So there's a number of different ways of looking at the motor entry point and also what the trigger point is. Let's say that tomorrow a patient comes in with sciatica. You use slump tests, you use straight leg raise tests, a neural tension test, and they're negative. So it doesn't seem like it's true sciatica. So what could be causing these sciatica-like sensations? There's a number of things that can. For example, a facet joint can cause referral pain. A sacroiliac joint can cause referral pain. Trigger points can cause the sciatica-like referral pain. So let's say that with this patient, you've done slump tests and straight leg raise and you've ruled out sacroiliac joint dysfunction or facet joint dysfunction and you're palpating along the iliac crest where the glute minimus attaches. And you find with palpation, it reproduces that patient's sciatica-like sensations. This is just in a hypothetical example. So you're looking at the glute minimus at its attachment site, or maybe the muscular tendon is junction site that you're palpating around that area. And it's away from the motor point, which would be in the muscle belly, halfway between the superior bore of the greater trochanter and the iliac crest. That point definitely needs to be treated because it's causing this person's sciatica or sciatic-like sensation it definitely needs to be treated. In TCM, we look at it as being either an excess or deficient. Is it cold? Is it damp? And we would treat it according to how we know how to get rid of and resolve damp or treat cold, reduce excess, reinforce the deficiency. It's all going to be predicated on your palpation. Now, from my experience, if we treated the motor points of the gluteus minimus first, that trigger point that was located two or three inches away would be difficult to find. It's not going to be reproducing that same type of paresthesia. So from my experience, I would like to treat the trigger point first. What I'll do clinically is treat the trigger point first because that's what's causing it. And then like what Josh was talking about before, let's treat the motor entry point because that's going to be then communicating quite a bit with the central nervous system about where that muscle is in space. You guys want to comment on that? Yeah, so I think um, another really great aspect to think about motor points is that in that particular case that you're talking about, uh, the motor points are also going to be incredibly useful to then treat the other muscles that might be, might be involved in why that glute minimus developed trigger points in the first place, right? So there may be uh, there may be some, you know, if there's like a pelvic imbalance where you have to look at the balance between the, the hip uh, AB doctors like the glute medius and minimus, plus with the adductors, plus with like the QL, um, that there may be this larger muscle imbalance issue between keeping the, the pelvis level in the, in the frontal plane, right? So it could be that treating the motor points of the adductor longus and brevis, the quadratus lumborum, and even using the motor points more in a TCM sense of looking at excess and deficiency to try and balance a lot of that is going to be a really important part of the treatment to keep that one gluteus minimus that's causing referral pattern 
to keep that from developing further trigger points, right? Because the trigger points could just be the end result, like the last symptom of a dysfunction that has been going on from these other areas, right? Um, or you might need to treat motor points uh, down in the in the calf or any of the motor points for the muscles that control the foot or the ankle, because maybe the glute minimus is developing trigger points because of it being overloaded because of an ankle dysfunction, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's another aspect to the balance between looking at trigger points versus motor points that can be really helpful mm -hmm. clinically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Brian, anything you want to say? Yeah, I'll just add into that some some distal channel points too. And now we have a pretty comprehensive picture. You know, we, we use this one a lot with the, the glute uh, medius or minimus, minimus in this case, because it's clearly on the gallbladder sinew channel. Matt, uh, uh, Josh mentioned the quadratus lumborum and the adductors, which we don't have time to go into it now, but the QL is uh, part of the liver sinew channel as the adductors are. So you could also include points um, to affect the relationship between those channels like source and low combination gallbladder 40 liver five would be a really good combination that we use quite frequently in the program so you know maybe we have this one point that's creating a referral but it's linked uh functionally with other muscular structures so glute minimus in this case linked with quadratus lumborum adductors in terms of how they're in dysfunction together so we can use motor points and trigger points and combinations of those muscles along with distal channel points. And uh, that's a starts to create a really good local distal and adjacent point combination from a TCM standpoint. Oh, awesome. Yeah, that's good. Let's go farther into that. So remember you guys, Osher points have been treated for thousands of years. So trigger points and tender motor points have been observed and treated with traditional techniques. And in some of the discussions that Josh and Brian have had is that when a trigger point is located in a different location than the motor entry point, it's really common to find a tight palpable band linking the two. So for example, from the motor entry point, if you cross fibered toward the trigger point, many times you'll actually find that tight palpable band linking the two, which maybe is why a pong needle technique was developed, which is really quite common in myofascial acupuncture by needling three or four needles in a row within that tight palpable band. One of the needles would be at the motor entry point. One of the needles or two of the needles might be at the trigger point. So you're covering those bases. And then as Brian was talking about linking that particular channel with points that will open up the channels in the collateral, she cleft, lubo points and such. And let's also remember, this patient, what's their internal balance? What's happening with them? How well can they handle inflammation? Because it's on the gallbladder channel, well, how is their liver and gallbladder functioning in their life? Could the liver and the gallbladder be contributing to part of this clinical picture? Always something for us to be able to consider because people are not just coming in as meat suits. We treat the entire patient. Great discussion, you guys. Yeah, another really interesting aspect to uh, bringing TCM theory into this is also looking at uh, general, like we can get into TCM basic constitutions, right? There's, I very f often find an element of spleen chi deficiency with certain types mm. of people who tend to develop a lot of trigger points because of mm. the, the spleen's ability to supply energy to muscles, right? Because the mm. um, trigger point formation is in a sense a problem with energy supply to the muscle after it gets damaged, right? There's a there's a very strong case to be made for looking at the importance of blood stasis and using herb formulas that treat a lot of blood stasis. Um, I think I mentioned maybe in the previous discussion that Brian and I had, I'm a big fan of the Ju Yu Tang family of formulas for treating various types of musculoskeletal pain for that uh, for that purpose. So I think that that's, that could be a whole other podcast we could talk about, like a yeah. TCM. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, no, the, also talking about like postural distortions and TCM constitutional diagnoses, and then talking about muscular relationships between postural distortions and TCM stuff. So that could be a whole other thing we could get into, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. That would be hours and hours and hours, or people could <laughs> just go to the SMAC program. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, this has been a great conversation, you guys, and I think there's a lot of clarity that was added to this. Um, 
we are right approaching that 30 minute mark right now. Is there any closing comments that you guys want to be able to say? Uh, I'll just say, well, first, um, Matt and Brian, thanks again for inviting me to do this. I really appreciate it. And uh, I just want to put it out there for everybody listening that the, the, the SMAC program, the sports medicine acupuncture program was one of the real turning points in my career. It kind of brought together, even though I've done a lot of work with trigger points and, and some orthopedic stuff before then, um, it really brought together uh, so many different elements of what I was trying to get at when I was doing um, orthopedic work with my patients that it's probably saved me 15 or 20 years of studying on my own, trying to do a lot of this together. So I just wanted to say thank you, Matt and Brian, for uh, giving people this opportunity. Okay. Well, thanks for saying that, Josh. Really appreciate that. That's good. Um, yeah, it's always welcome. And no, Josh, you didn't bug me with your questions during the SMAC program. You said that on a little note. No, you just have a very inquisitive mind. And the thing is, is that kind of dialogue is so welcomed because other people are stimulated by that kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. So it's always welcomed. So thank you, Josh, for that. Also, um, for more, let, let me finish this one real quick, Brian. Okay. Uh, for more information about Josh, uh, in the comment section, there's uh, three different links that um, he's talking about trigger points. For anybody who's interested in a motor point chart or motor point book, there's also, there's going to be um, links for that as well. Go for, what, what, Brian? Yeah, on the topic of uh, messages coming up, there was a question which we could go into a lot of detail and we don't have time, but it was about osteoarthritis of the hip. Um, and I just wanna quickly say that the same discussion we were just having about balancing the pelvis um, by using motor points uh, in terms of like, if there's a, a elevated ilium, QL, glute medius and minimus and the combination of motor points plus uh, distal points that'll help balance the hip joint would be really a great idea for osteoarthritis. But you could also look at the, what trigger point referrals are referring to that region of pain. The hip joint itself can refer pain and can be, can be the pain source, sure. But since we're talking about trigger points and, and motor points, looking at the trigger points that are part of that referral, uh, it could be that the trigger point is causing 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 percent of that pain. Um, so also treating the, the uh, looking for trigger points in those um, regions that could be referring to that area would be uh, would be a good idea to start with. Josh, want to say something? I've got something to add. Um, uh, the only thing I would add to that is if you're not used to looking up trigger point refer uh, referral patterns, it not is going to not just be the muscles locally to the hip, right? One of the muscles that might recreate something like uh, osteoarthritis of the hip could be like the longissimus muscles up around the thoracolumbar junction around T12, right? That can refer pain down mm -hmm. to the trochanter. So there's a, a lot that had that a lot of um, resources out there to allow you to look up for pain in one particular area of the body. What is the list of different muscles that can all refer to that area? It's really helpful looking. You can find those online. It's in Travel. Um, uh, yeah, very useful resource. Um, just to add some clarity with this one, because I don't know what, what kind of diagnostics were made with the osteoarthritis. Mm -hmm. So the patient may actually have confirmed osteoarthritis, but now these comments that we're making is that um, there also could be uh, pain contributors, which would be trigger points. Now, as we know, uh, trigger points can also live not only in muscle tissue that we've been addressing over these last couple of hours, it also can live in joint capsules, tendons, ligaments. So needling the joint capsule itself may mm -hmm. also help in this particular case mm -hmm. as well. All right, anything else, gentlemen? Mm -hmm. I think we, uh, we covered most of the stuff we wanted to cover. All right, well, thank you very much. Really, really appreciate it. And so uh, stay tuned for next week. Come in, uh, check, in, check out Jeffrey Grossman for next week. And Brian, it's always nice hanging out with you. Josh, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Josh, for joining. Thank you, guys. Thanks, you guys. Bye now. Bye-bye.